Well, if you'll turn to Romans chapter 11. As a church, we're studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. It's only been three and a half years, but we are getting through it. This morning, we find ourselves in, in chapter 11. And it's an amazing chapter where Paul's kind of given us this panoramic view of God's purpose and his design for all of history. Where else do you get that? I always think, why are people golfing when you're looking at God's creation? What's he doing? Why is he doing it? Where is it going to end? And it ends in him. The gospel frees us from all this being about me. The, the gospel can set you free from a life built on yourself. This is something so much better than you and your little kingdom. It's God and his kingdom and us thanking God forever for giving us eyes to see and behold the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what a beautiful chapter, and we will continue in that now, but let's ask God for his blessing on his word. And I just remind you again, this is worship as we continue to open the word of God and worship him for who he is and what he has done. So let's pray as a church. Father, we come before you and I thank you for the salvation of will. God, what a beautiful uh, testimony of your grace. I thank you now for what you're revealing in Romans 11. And God, I pray now that your spirit would teach us through your word, Lord, that your word would be what is taught and we, uh, it would be illuminated by your spirit for us to understand it in such a way that it transforms and changes the way we will enter into the world tomorrow. So God, make us like Jesus Christ, make us holy, conform us to your image. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> well, last time we were together in Romans, we started the thesis statement of the chapter, which is Romans 11.1. 1. Paul says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. And so uh, it came out of Romans 10.21, where God says to Israel, all day long, I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. That's the history of Israel. And so we're coming and saying, is God done with them? Has he rejected his people? And the great answer, we looked last time five ways. He goes, no, 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 no. Uh, we looked rhetorically at the grammar, uh, grammatically, personally, theologically, that those whom he foreknew, he didn't reject. And we looked at it historically with those who were the remnant that didn't bow their knee to Baal. And so there's been a remnant throughout the history of Israel that have been pulled out and saved by God's sovereign grace. And this morning, we're going to look at the other side now. What about the rest of the nation? We, we've looked at the remnant, but what about the nation of Israel as a whole? And we've seen, we're going to see this morning, they've been hardened by a sovereign decree of God with human responsibility. They, they have real guilt, real rejection. They won't submit to God's righteousness in Christ. They want to do it through the law themselves, and they've rejected the Savior. They've spit him out and they've crucified him. And those are the two poles that you must keep in Scripture, the sovereignty of God and the human responsibility of man that God causes those two things to be true. Two poles that we must have in our understanding of the Christian life. So Paul, this morning your outline is he'll give you two considerations about Israel. In verses 7 through 10, we're going to look at the present status of Israel and then in verses 11 through 15, there's a future anticipation for this nation. And so if you'll come with me then to verse 11, <coughs> where we left off, I, I say then, uh, verse 7, what then? What then? This ties into 11, 1 through 6 that we looked at last week. I, what then? Literal Greek, what Israel is seeking, this it has not obtained. And so as we begin this morning, what was Israel seeking that they did not obtain here in verse 7. And they were seeking a relationship with God. They wanted the forgiveness of sins. God says, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. That's what I want. I want shalom, peace, wholeness, wellness. This Greek word for seeking, it has a preposition in front of it. And it just intensifies the word. They were earnestly seeking it. They weren't playing at this. They were going at it with all of their being. It's in the present tense. They are still seeking it even this morning. And Paul says they have a zeal without knowledge. They don't have true knowledge, epinosis. They don't understand the gospel. They're just trying to get right with God through law. 
How they were going about it was the problem. They're in Romans 9, 30 through 31, they were seeking to establish their own righteousness by the law. They, they wanted to accomplish it themselves. And as a result, they stumbled over Jesus Christ, who said in Romans 10, 4, Jesus is the end of the law for everyone who believes. And they just stumbled over Christ, so they rejected him. They hated him because he said, you're sinners, your righteousness is a filthy rag, so they killed him. Let that hit you. This, it has not obtained. The word obtain means to hit the mark, to miss God's moral mark. They miss God's mark of righteousness by a million miles. All their human goodness and trying missed what God requires of man by a million miles. Because divine righteousness is what's required. And human righteousness will never get close. We looked at it in Sunday school. You, you, can't get, you, you can't even walk in close to the sun. You'll burn up. You'll never get in without God's righteousness wrapped around you or you'll be consumed. And so we've seen this picture of running up to God with a big smile on the last day with your handful of your supposed righteousness and when you see God, he says, you're going to be holding a filthy rag before him. So if anyone's come in this morning and you think your own goodness and righteousness will stand up on the last day of judgment, it'll, it'll be consumed and it will be a filthy rag. There's a better righteousness that God gives in this gospel. So Israel missed it. And so do the multitudes today. Every cult teaches that you do human righteousness and God will be appeased and he'll be happy. The supposed evangelical church has people sitting in their churches every Sunday trying to merit salvation. So what do you make of Christ? You will reject Christ if you have your own righteousness. You won't need him. You'll push him off. He won't be who he's supposed to be. You'll stumble over the stumbling stone if you have your own goodness and righteousness and everyone's bad and I'm good. You're in danger this morning sitting in that place. Yes, but if we come to this, in the, into this world wired to think that we're good and our righteousness will surely cause us to stand on that last day, the question is, how can anyone be saved then? If that's how we're hardwired, how do you get to Jesus with no righteousness like the testimony you just heard? How, how are we ever gonna get there? We'll come back to verse seven. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it. Those who were chosen by God obtained it. Will, Will was chosen by God. Those whom before the foundation of the world, God chose to display his infinite grace upon, which we studied a long time in Romans 9, they obtained it. What did they obtain? Divine righteousness. A righteousness not their own, a righteousness that Christ has come and given and manifested in who he is, you're given that. That's how. You get God and a love relationship and all the blessings that flow. That's what it means to attain it. Those who did not stumble over the cornerstone. Because this morning, Jesus Christ to you is a treasure hidden in a field. He's the end of the law. You're looking to him for all of your salvation and all of your life. That's the one who's been chosen. You don't stumble over Jesus. He's your treasure. He's your love. He's your hope. He's your Lord. That's how you know if you've received this beautiful grace. Grace caused them to view Christ as their only hope of righteousness and salvation. And that is such a gift that the natural man will never see. I've preached this for 20 years to some people and they never see it. And they still say, I hope when I die, my goodness, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. Has God chosen you and revealed to you your righteousness is a filthy rag and Christ is infinite and it comes to the one who has faith? That's how you know. Paul says the Jews who were chosen... Paul says, I'm one of them. And he said, there's 7,000 who didn't bow their knee to Baal in the verse, first six verses. He says, they obtained it. Now come back to verse seven. What happened to the rest? The rest of Israel. <coughs> he says, the rest were hardened. 
And so this is some difficult stuff. If your first Sunday here, we've labored through Romans 9, looking at all this, that's a hard doctrine. It's in the aorist passive. We call it a divine passive. It's, it's not actively hardening. It's letting something broken go its own way. And Paul just keeps staying um, consistent all the way through here. Election is active. God reaches into your life. He comes. He opens your eyes. He draws you to himself. And passive, every time when he, there's reprobation, it's always passive. Fallen clay. Let it go its own desires. He doesn't come in and make you hard. And he does it in such a way that chapter 10 says man is still responsible for, and guilty for his rejection of Jesus Christ. He'll never be able to blame God on the last day. And so God does not make them disbelieve. He withholds, he withholds the grace of regeneration and salvation. So come look at this with me. The rest were hardened. This Greek word meant to, to make like stone, to putrefy or calcification. Way back in Greek literature, it referred to kidney stones, calluses. And it went from the medical arena to a metaphorical arena into biblical Greek. And it meant morally to take away from the heart the faculty of being touched by what is good and what is divine. You just can't get spiritual things. You have no spiritual taste buds for Jesus. Your heart is like a kidney stone when it comes to Jesus Christ. But make sure that you get this. The history of Israel is in God's hands. And so he's in control and sovereign over all of history. And he's telling us this morning his plan of what he's doing with Israel, what he's doing with Gentiles, and how he's going to close this whole thing up. It's all plan A. Gentiles are not plan B. This is all plan A of God's redemptive history, which is going to bring great application uh, as we close this out this morning. So this is a hard reality, and people just don't talk this way, but God does. It's a hard truth. It needs some strong support. And so Paul's now going to go to the law and the prophets and the Psalms to show them that this is what God said he would do with Israel. And so look at verse 8. <coughs> verse 8. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not and ears to hear not. And he's quoting Isaiah 29.10, Deuteronomy 29.4, and even a little bit of Isaiah 6.9. It's all brought into this one quote. And I just want to bring that all together. It says God's given them a, a stupor. And this is a great word. It meant to be dazed by a punch. So when you're watching a fight or you, maybe you've been punched, you get hit in the face and you just don't even know where you are. You're, you've lost your senses. You're not even aware of... What, where, where am I at? And so you're just out of it. You can't see or hear what you should. So it's a great word to describe unbelievers. It says you're in a stupor. You're in a stupor. So Israel is in a stupor when Jesus Christ is proclaimed to them. Talk about law keeping and they're brilliant. Talk about the gospel and they're like, they're like they got punched in the face and it doesn't make any sense. When Jesus Christ is proclaimed, it's like, boom, I don't get it. They can't think. They can't understand it. And so they just look back to the Mosaic law and say, I can establish my righteousness. I can do it myself. And I watch this again and again with Gentiles sitting here this morning. It's no different. You're in a stupor and you just can't get this. And he says, it's this way and in verse uh, eight down to this very day. This started since God has called out Abraham. You read it all the way through Genesis, there's a remnant. And there's a stupor to the rest of the nation. They keep worshiping Molech and idols and going after sin and other, other nations. And, and it just keeps going throughout their history. You go to judges and kings and prophets. I read it, I'm just like, it's a stupor. It's like, wake up. To the time when Jesus Christ comes into the world you see some elect like Mary and Elizabeth and Zacharias and Simeon and Anna and, and the rest are hardened. And even to this very day that we live in, Paul tells us this is the state of Israel as we sit here this morning. There is still a remnant being called out, but the majority are hardened. Look with me in verse 9. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. 
let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs <coughs> forever. So this is a quote from Psalm 69, verses 22 through 23. And David is writing it, and he's saying, let the blessings that you gave them Israel, become a curse. There, there's a table. And he talks about this table, which is an emblem of presumptuous security. It's what they were given in Romans 9, 4 through 5, the law, the prophets, all the things that God gave to Israel. He said it's become a snare. It's become a trap. The common graces of God and this covenant that God entered into with Israel, inviting the nation to your table, so to speak. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. I'll sup with you. He's inviting them into the table. And the blessings that God has given to them as a nation has stumbled them. They drink up the blessings and not the giver. The harm that this has brought to Israel has been great. This is what hardening does. The, the things that should lead us to God become our gods. And I'll tell you now, we have common grace all over this nation. And it was to lead us to God. Your kindness is to lead us to repentance. And it's led us to arrogance and pride and, and, and just wanting more and more and materialistic things. They became our gods. America the beautiful the blessings that were to lead us to God, churches on every corner preaching the word of God, his kindness to us has become our God. And it's brought blindness and stupor. If I had to describe an American Christianity, I see more stupor than anything. Like you've been punched in the face. It's brought a hardening. And Jesus is preached and we're like a man punched in the face from all our carnal delights and the common graces of God that have been given to us. That's a powerful word this morning. Look with me in verse 10. And bend their backs forever. This refers to like a bowed downness. It implies a heavy burden or a load. And it's a weight that you carry or bear. And Jesus says the Pharisees, they they bind you up with all their rules, uh, a weight that they can't even carry. And he goes right back to the law and legalism. They don't obtain it because they're seeking it by works and it's heavy and it's a burden. Any of you living under the law to get right with God, you know what I'm talking about. It's heavy. It bows you down. It sits on you all day long. And so God gives us two pictures of hardening. He tells us there's a table with pleasures that are misused. And then it's a man bent over with a heavy load of legalism. Two ways to be hardened. A sensual way or in a legalistic way. The history of Israel was both. When when the remedy for both was being offered to them in Jesus Christ, that's the hardening. That's the stupor towards God and his remedy of a promised Messiah. And in this gospel the veil can be lifted so that you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The stupor goes away and I see Christ in all his glory and I surrender and I believe and my cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. When God says, let there be light, you see him in all of his beauty and all of his glory. So let me summarize as we move to Paul's next argument. God has not rejected his people He foreknew them. Paul was a Jew. Said if he's rejected them, why am I one? 7,000 didn't bow their knee to Baal. He's not cast his people off totally. And again, it's all according to God's purpose with election and reprobation. And so now this morning, we're going to answer one more question. I'll let you go home. Verse 11, (coughs) he goes one more. I say then, they, Israel did not stumble so as to fall, did they? They, they, That's such a good question. Is it over for Israel as a nation then? They blew it. They're done. No more place in redemptive history but to hate God and anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that it? Is God just done with his people that he, he chose of all the nations you only have I loved and made promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob? We're right back to the question that brought this whole section up of chapter 8. Can he keep a messed up guy like me? 
God promises to hold me and nothing can separate me from his love. And I got sin and I have battles and struggles. Is he going to just let me go? Is he going to be done with me? I'm Israel, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Are you going to cast me off then? This has to be answered. We, we got to get an answer for this. And that's why we have Romans 9 through 11. I say then, oh, little fella. I think he wanted me, sorry. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? It has a negative particle that demands a negative answer. They did stumble. They killed Jesus. They did trip so as to fall. That's the question. But was it a fatal fall? To fall where they rise no more. To fall in an irreversible or irre ir irrecoverable manner. Such a crash, kids, that you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Just to make sure we don't go down the wrong path here, Paul puts this emphatic me genoitoi, and it means, God forbid, may it never be, that's impossible. And again, it's as emphatic as antinomianism back in Romans 6, should we just sin that grace might increase? May it never be. Is, 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 is Israel sinned in such a way as to fall? May it never be. No way is God done with this nation that he foreknew. And so this is the basic statement. The rest of the chapter is built on this statement. And I want to look at Paul's two arguments. He has two headings here. He says, the failure of Israel is not pointless, and the failure of Israel is not permanent. And so the failure of Israel is not pointless. Just again, this whole thing is according to divine purpose. I want you to see it this morning and marvel at your God because we got to get to Romans eleven thirty three through 36 for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. That's where Paul is driving this. There's a purpose in Israel's failure and rejection of its Messiah. And the question is, what is that? What is that? Look at verse 11. <clears throat> By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. This is a loaded statement. By their transgression, it means to miss the mark, a false step. Transgression, trying to establish their own righteousness through the law, they killed the only one who could give them righteousness. That's a misstep. That's a big misstep. And so now he says salvation then has come to the Gentiles. Christ came for the Jews. They rejected him. Paul would go to the synagogues and they would kick him out. And they go to the Gentiles. And so this good purpose of God is, is why now Gentiles mostly here this morning, why now we can come in to this gospel promise. That is why salvation is from the Jews. I'm just going to read you a couple verses. Acts 13, 46. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, Jews. Since you repudiate it, and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. 1 Thessalonians 2.14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. With the result, they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. So Christ came as a Jewish Messiah. He preached the gospel to them. Um, the ones known to God from eternity, uh, they rejected him, and, and it led to the cross where he was crucified. And now there's a persistent rejection now by the Jews that drew the apostles now to go preach to the Gentiles. And it opened the floodgates that all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the nations can come into this gospel that was promised to Abraham thousands of years ago. There's even more purpose. He says to make them jealous. To make them jealous. 
So God now sends the, the gospel to the Gentiles. And the Jews are supposed to see this now and be provoked to jealousy. They, they have what was meant for us. Romans 10.19. Let me just read it to you. Romans 10.19. But I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? For Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding, I will anger you. Isaiah 9, for unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder. And and we're supposed to let them look at us and go, that's our son. That's our son. Isaiah 53, he's like a sheep that was led to slaughter for our transgressions. That's ours. That's our lamb that's slain. It's like the guy sitting behind his ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend at the movies, just looking, going, this is killing me. That's my girlfriend. And he's saying, I want you to see, that's my Savior. That's my Messiah. And you Gentiles are drinking it up and loving him and being changed and transformed. And they're, they're jealous. You, you got Messiah. You have the Savior of the world. Why? So that they might be saved. Robert Haldane said, we ought to remember that the Lord may have infinitely wise and gracious motives for his most severe and terrible judgments. And he brings this judgment upon Israel to bring about this beautiful ingathering of the nations. And so I want you to get something and don't miss it. There's a couple things I just want to clarify. I'm going to do this more and more as we journey. But this is clear. Verse 15, it says, for the Jewish rejection brings the reconciliation of Gentiles, what will their acceptance be? In verses 17 through 24, we'll look at in two weeks, uh, branches are broken off, Jewish branches, Gentiles are grafted into these promises, and then Israel are brought back into the tree. 25 through 26, there's a hardening on the Jews. So the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, and then all Israel will be saved. Verses 30 through 31, they're disobedient. And we were shown mercy because of it, And then he says, now they are shown mercy. Again, 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 again. He just keeps repeating it. This is the purpose of God. To save Israel by jealousy. It's so good. So the application, wake up. I'm after you, sleepers. Oh, so the application for all of us this morning Has your salvation made anyone jealous of what you have? And that needs to be answered with judgment day honesty. Has your salvation and the joy and what you have found in Christ and the transformation of life made anyone jealous? Has anyone ever asked you what is the hope within you? Do you always have to tell them because no one ever asks? That needs to be answered this morning because that's the purpose of God. What do you think will make someone jealous? Well, the Jews enjoying Yahweh. Father, son, adoption. The Messiah that was promised for thousands of years. I'm in a one union with. All my sins, though they are scarlet, have been made as white as snow. I have the righteousness of Christ put to my account, adopted, adopted. It's transforming me from the inside to the out. It's producing a love and a joy and a peace that I never had under the law. Pretty simple. Lemon-sucking Christians make nobody jealous. Nobody. And so I just want you to wrestle. There's this beautiful, glorious gospel that we've been looking at for three years. So sweet and treasured and transforming you that people are jealous of what you have. I want the Savior that you have. That's the design that God's talking about, Paul's talking here through the Holy Spirit. I've been praying that for every one of us. I want people jealous of what we have. So Israel's failure, it's not pointless. There's a point to it. And I want to close out with Israel's failure is not Permanent. Look with me in verse 12. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their 
fulfillment be? This whole argument, how much more, how great is going to come from their fulfillment? And that, that's a big part of why I take the interpretation I take here through Romans 11. This isn't something small. This is something big. If, if that happened, the riches to the world and everything of Gentiles coming in and believing, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, and as much as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. So we get the lesser to the greater argument. If the Jews fall and it brings riches to the world, how much more their restoration? And this now if is translated in the Greek since. So since riches go out to the Gentiles by a massive Jewish rejection of Messiah, Israel's transgression is gain and it's riches for the whole world. It's anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. He's abounding in riches for everyone who calls upon Christ. And so it's just so much riches. Salvation is riches. And this makes jealousy. In the world, people are jealous of riches. In the kingdom of God, they're jealous of the riches that we have in Jesus Christ. It brings jealousy. I pray that you see your salvation this way. I walk around reveling in the riches of the salvation that I have, not grumbling with everything I don't have, what it should be, what it could be. I'm taken up with Jesus Christ and all the riches that have come to me by grace through faith. Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, incarnation, that you through his poverty might become rich. So few live like it's riches. Just always upset at what the world calls riches and not having them. You're going to inherit the whole earth. You are so rich in righteousness this morning. You are so rich in relationship with God. Riches that moth and rust cannot destroy. A hope that cannot disappoint. Gentiles, do you get what this hardening of the Jews has brought to you? Eternal riches. Live into this and you'll make people jealous. Go out there and show the Jews the beauty of this salvation. And go show Gentiles your riches. Open up your treasure chests and go show them the beauties of what you have in Jesus Christ. Back to Paul's argument, I just get lost in riches. I, I don't know what it is. So if their transgression brought riches to the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? The word fulfillment means plenitude, totality, to full complement. So at the end, when this nation has rejected Jesus Christ for thousands of years, they're going to look upon him whom they've crucified and they're going to see that he was their promised Messiah. And they're going to fall at his feet. My interpretation is millions and millions of Jews. I don't know, someone asked me, what about half Jew, half Gentile, all the different things? Where the, I, I don't know. I just can see in this text there's something mighty that comes and, and I'm looking at millions and millions of Jews falling at the feet of Jesus Christ and believing in what, the, what the God has given to them so as to be saved by believing upon and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as their Messiah, Yeshua. The weeping and the joy that will fill the air. There's never been anything like it in the history of the world. And I always wonder what it would be like. I'd love to see it. I just get excited when one soul repents and believes on Christ. It lights me up for a month. And even now, such great blessings to the world with a fallen Israel. How much more when God again deals with his people through mercy and grace. They will look upon him whom they crucified by the grace of God and bow to him as the Son of God, incarnate Messiah. Paul's going to take it a step further. If you'll go with me, we're almost done. Verse 13. <laughs> but I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. And as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. So I'm, I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. The word is diacon, diaconia, deacon, general word for service. I magnify my service and my ministry. How? I do it by verse 14. I do it if somehow... 
I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen, the Jews, and save some of them. So it's important that Paul did not labor among Gentiles only, but also he's, he's laboring and preaching the gospel, but he says also so it might save some Jews by bringing them to jealousy. Paul loved his calling. He longed for Gentile souls. He, he labored for them. He evangelized them. He explained the great plan of God over and over. Yet God has this ultimate plan in the whole thing, that the more Gentiles saved and brought to Christ, it might move to jealousy. He says, my sarks, my, my flesh, my own countrymen, my kinsmen. And so this is cool. He, he said in Romans 9, I would go to hell if they could be saved. Romans 10, 1, I pray for their salvation. Then he says in Romans 10, 15, I preach the gospel to them. And now he says, I labor for the Gentiles so I can make my fellow countrymen jealous that they might fall on Jesus Christ. And I pray we know something about this as a church. And in verse 15, for if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead. Again, it's a sense assumed true for the sake of argument. <clears throat> if their rejection, it meant to jettison cargo. They, they looked at Jesus, they saw no value in him, and they jettisoned, they cast him away. And if that brought reconciliation to the world, that we're, we're getting peace with God now through our Lord Jesus Christ, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Three views on life from the dead that I came across, the main views. The first one is it's kind of a figurative expression of like a joyful and desirable event. I don't think that's it. The other two I wrestle back and forth with. If you have a final conclusion, I'll let you share it next week. Um, the, the one would be a final resurrection. Life from the dead. What, what could be more climactic than the closing up of history and all that will happen in Jesus' return what, what more life would that bring than to finally have the consummation of all things? And the other view is it, it would be the spiritual regeneration of Israel. Israel's going to believe on Jesus. They, they're dead in their sins. Uh, they're going to yield their hearts to Christ. They're going to be born again into a spiritual resurrection. Uh, they'll have a rebirth in the final days. And so when you consider all the revivals in history, can you imagine this one. And so we'll keep flushing that out as we go, but there's going to be something mighty as the fulfillment of what he's talking about in this passage. So I want to close out with just a couple thoughts. What is the basis of Gentile salvation and the massive Jewish one at the end of history? If you go back to Romans 11:5. five, in the same way, there's also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. And so what's obvious in this section, nothing has caused it. Nothing in you has caused the grace of God to operate. And nothing, um, um, the hardened ones were not passed over because they were worse than the elect. I, I was way worse than most unbelievers I know. And so this is big as we, consider it, is this a deep-seated principle in your heart this morning that there was nothing in you to turn God's heart towards you but just away? And sovereign grace alone acted on your life and made Jesus altogether lovely. Have you ever gotten over that? I can't get over it. Second, I just want you to look at the sovereignty of God in history the beautiful way he's in perfect control and unfolding his will. This matters when your husband has tumors growing on his lungs or a wife leaves you, your job pressures, you lose your job and you have a family. This truth means so much to me when I look at how God has run history so that he could show mercy to all to bring my issues and my life under that sovereign hand. My life is under God and it's safe and it ends with blessings on my head for all of eternity. And so whatever you're facing, whatever trials, to see this God can bring comfort and peace that he's your Abba and he's bringing all these things to work for your good, to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. 
Thirdly, the American church, I just think we're way too big on immediate application. I just want to fix it right now. Give me something so I can run and change it right away. And I think it's hurt us because we don't build foundations like what we're seeing in Romans. And that causes us to stand in the storms of life like what we're facing now as a country. We have this little unweighty God that exists to make us happy in America, and we need this real God to, to give us ballast in the storms that are coming upon us. Fourth, what shall be our, our attitude and our heart toward Israel? I know one is not to be anti-Semitic. On the other side, I hear this, if we bless Israel, God will bless us. But we've taken Israel and made it Mary for the Catholics. As Mary, I grew up, you prayed to Mary because she could go to Jesus and kind of get him to be more favorable toward me. How about his work was enough? How about his work is enough that isn't if I'm nice to Israel, God will bless me? That isn't it. You fall off on either side. I had this dear lady, when I told her I was in Romans 11, she said, preach Israel. No. I'm preaching Romans 11, 33 through 36. And this is how God works redemptive history and all that he's doing. If this doesn't end up worshiping God and saying from him, through him, and to him are all things to God be the glory forever, amen, you missed it. This isn't about preaching Israel. It's about preaching God and his purposes and what he's doing. Should be like Paul's. I, I have compassion for Israel. I pray for their conversion. I preach. I make them jealous by being transformed and loving their Messiah. But they are your enemies in regards to the gospel, Paul is going to say, yet loved for the sake of the fathers. And we'll unfold all of that as we go. And, and we're just going to keep looking at things that can fall off the cliff and things on either side. And I, most of you will hate me by the end because I'm going to step on every possible toe, every different. But I, I just, there's things that are clear that unify us in Romans 11. And there's some things that will disunify us that shouldn't. And we're going to keep journeying through those pieces as well. And then I'm going to close out with the hard question. <laughs> Again, am I making anyone jealous for my gospel? Is my wife jealous for the beauties and the glories of Christ by my life? Do my kids want to know the Savior that I treasure and seek and love and make known? Do my neighbors want this Christ? Do my workmates or my employees, do, am I making anyone jealous for the beauty of what I've found in Jesus Christ? If I could pray for anything, that's what I ask for me and for every one of you here this morning. This Savior is so beautiful. Go, go make people jealous with the beauty of the treasure that you have, the riches that you have found in Christ Jesus instead of the grumbling, moping, complaining, fruitless. That's never going to make people jealous. That's, that's what I hear. I don't want anything to do with Christianity. Jim, who works next to me, is the biggest hypocrite in the office. I'm praying for something different as we behold the Christ that we've looked at here in Romans. So let's go Make unbelievers jealous, amen? Father, I pray that we would get so filled up with the beauties of Christ and the metamorphosis that comes from beholding him. Lord, that we would be filled with love and joy and peace and the fruits of the Spirit. And so people would be jealous of what we have and they would ask us for the hope within. And as they're dying and watching their hope of a country disintegrate, Oh God, we are just steadfast. We are, we're not bound to country. Our citizenship's in heaven. God, let us put on display the beauties and the glories of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that we would make Jewish people jealous of the Savior that came in the world from the seed of Abraham. God, I pray that we would make Gentiles jealous as they chase the things of this world and they're not satisfying. God, let us be united as one 
and making people jealous as we treasure this beautiful, glorious Savior. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.